Welcome everybody again. It's good to be together. We are in Luke chapter 20, and we're going to be picking up in verse 20 uh, tonight. Um, we had the, the parable of the tenants, um, the, the rejection of Jesus is pictured in the parable, but also the rejection of those who reject him and who uh, who uh, refused to, to to give to him what he uh, what he asked for, um, and and uh, the the people to whom that parable is mainly addressed in Jesus' day, we pointed out how you know we could certainly be the recipients of this parable, and and, and we need to hear it. But the people to whom it was announced in, uh, are intended in Jesus' day. Uh, the teachers of the law, the chief priests, uh, they, they knew that he was, uh, he was talking about them, and they resented it, and they're looking for a way to arrest him, verse 19 says, but they're afraid of the people. What does it mean they're afraid of the people? It was very popular. Jesus has a lot of followers. Okay, Jesus has followers. Jesus has people who... Who at, at this point in time a lot of supporters, or a lot of a lot of support, and gaining favor. There and, might have been, you know, protests or, or unrest, and I know that uh, that was some, the the Romans kind of let the Jewish people practice their religion as long as they, they didn't the have any kind of uh, problems. So that if. People started protesting, the Romans would be very happy about that. The, the Romans were typically happy to let subject people govern themselves as long as there was peace, right? As long as everything was, was calm and uh, the tribute money got, uh, got where it was supposed to go. Uh, they were happy if, if, uh, if subjects governed themselves. And, uh, and the last thing that, uh, that these people wanted was... Uh, Unrest. So they're trying to uh, to find a way to arrest Jesus, but without uh, upsetting a lot of people. And for that, they need pretext, right? They need a reason. And so, in chapter twenty, uh, verse twenty of chapter twenty, that's that's what we get. We get this attempt, a couple of attempts, to trap him, uh, to to get him to say something that will incriminate himself. They begin with. Uh, and it says they, they, they sent spies who pretended to be sincere. It's very cloak and dagger stuff here in Luke at this point in time, right? They, 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 they put plants in the audience, people who can ask the questions that might trip him up. And, uh, and so uh, these spies in verse 21 question him. We know that you speak and teach what's right, and that you do not show partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. But they're really laying it on thick, aren't they? They, they? You know, we know you speak the truth, teacher. They don't know any such thing. They don't believe that at all. But they're 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 trying to get him to let his guard down. And so they ask the question: Is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Do you see why that could be a problematic question? Well, if he says no, don't don't pay to you owe your Money, your you know, uh, your any kind of uh, income that you know you have to. You're, they were supposed to give a tenth, I think, to the uh, to the temple, and uh, so no, don't give it to Caesar. Give it to the, the you know the temple, and uh, of course, and that then they could tell the Roman authority, well, here, this guy is telling the people that they don't have to pay. The taxes, but then if he says uh, yes, pay the taxes, that's something then that they could tell the people. Well, you know, he's saying you don't have to give any money to these. You know, going against the religion. So they're they're. I think they're feeling. I go. You know, this is a really clever way to uh, to trap him. I, I think they're feeling very good about themselves as they ask this question, right? Because they do. They've got him seemingly backed into a little bit of a corner. There's no good answer, right? There's no, there's no yes or no. 
it's not going to be a good answer. Uh, if it's the, it's probably the tribute tax they're talking about, which would be the tax that Rome would require. Um, and uh, if 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 that's what they're referring to, uh, then yeah, it, it's tantamount to sedition to say no, don't pay the tax. If uh, if he does say pay the tax, though, it's pretty unpopular. And it's sure to undermine his popularity with people to uh, to to do this. And in addition to the fact that maybe there are some who who feel like that that conflicts, as you said, with uh, the, their faith. Um, and so, how does Jesus answer? But he doesn't answer the question, right? He's like a politician, you know. He <laughs> asks a real tough question, right? You see this on TV. <laughs> And the newspaper guys are trying to, women are trying to get them in a corner. Same kind of thing here. So they they answer, but you know, they always deflect it and they go, they change the subject, maybe. Yeah. They're real man. Some people are oh, these apologies are real masters. Yeah. So so is that what he does? Does he does he not answer the question? Does he deflect? What is, what is, how exactly does he does this does this respond to the question? He doesn't answer it directly. He says, show me a denarius. The, the coin, the, the sort of the, the day's wage, the, the, the silver coin was a day's wage that Roman denarius would have had a picture of Caesar <laughs> and an inscription on it. I've got one. I should have brought it. I've got a copy of one, but I've, I've got one at my house. I should have brought it with me. Forgot to. Uh, it does. It's got a, 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 a engraving of Caesar and an inscription uh, of Caesar uh, on the coin itself. Um, and what does he say? What's the point of that? Who, whose image in the scripture are on? What's, what's the point? They say Caesar's, and so what's the application? It is Caesar's to give it to him. I think the answer is yes. If it's Caesar's, by all means, <laughs> give it to him, right? <laughs> if, if this is Caesar's money, let him have it. Why, why would you try to keep it from him? He's essentially saying, <laughs> give, it, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. We, of course, in the United States, we stamp in God we trust on our money. So <laughs> but, feel uh -oh. better. We're on to it, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but but, it, but in, in, uh, in, in Roman times, Caesar's money. Give Caesar <laughs> his money and give to God what is God's. So for Jesus, there's not a conflict here, right? To, to, to give to Caesar is, is right and proper. And it doesn't at all encroach upon giving to God what belongs to God. Jesus has no problem with this. Um, what he's saying, though, is there are boundaries. And he puts the boundaries on, right? There's boundaries, give money to the government, boundaries, giving money to God. So it's a brilliant answer. Probably the most brilliant answer he gives of any time he was questioned, I would say. And it certainly de defuses their little trap, right? Because now they've got nothing to, to they, they can't really contradict anything he said. Uh, the, the, the money, it speaks for itself. It belongs to Caesar. Give it to Caesar. What does that imply for Jesus about money, by the way? Very important issue. An important issue. But not the most important. Thing. Not not the most central thing, right? Mm -hmm. Not not the thing we ought to be up in arms about. Not the thing we ought to be worried about and focused on. And and certainly, I think the impression might be, you know, you don't don't go out of your way to accumulate and accumulate and hoard and hoard, right? It, that money is an instrument, it's a tool. Um, it's, a, it's a different way of thinking. What you're gonna see in all of these little event, these vignettes is that, that Jesus is gonna try to change some perspective, change some ways of thinking. Uh, you've got these, these people here who want to draw this sharp line between their religion and their civic identity, right? And, and Jesus doesn't, doesn't want to do that. He's, he's all right to say, look, we, we've got the responsibility to the state. We've got the responsibility to give to Caesar what Caesar's. And that doesn't necessarily con conflict with giving to God what is God's. Um, and, and, and so he wants us to keep both those plates spinning, right? Both those balls in the air as we, as we live, live our lives. 
Other thoughts on that? One of my professors said that, uh, well, the systematic theology that John Castling had said that he understood it as God's image, give God's image to God, okay, i.e., you're the image of God, devote yourself to God, okay. Yeah. Um, I think probably the traditional, like, you know, you're using Caesar's property, you know, but it's open-ended. Well, it's it's interesting, isn't it, that there's the the word image there, and now you'd expect image in, in, in what Jesus says here, but but that does maybe evoke a couple of things. It evokes the idea of graven images, right, in the Old Testament. The idea of, in fact, uh, the Jews in Jesus' day still didn't want to use Roman coinage in the temple, and because it had an image on it, right, it had this, this graven image. So they still didn't want to do that. So it, it evokes that. It also evokes what you just mentioned, Robert, the, the idea of human beings being the image of God. Um, and that, that, that certainly is possible. It certainly is possible that that's, he's got that in mind as well. Um, you know, this reminds me in some ways, like the Samaritan woman, how Jesus dealt with them bringing the woman. And I see that they're, they're having a scheme. They call him teacher. They're pretending to be his follower or whatever. And he does the same thing to them. He responds in such a way he silences them. It says at the end, they were silent. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the older man at first drift off and left Jesus standing there. But he has a way in a very just calm, godly, just very favorably how he makes people look at themselves or back up from what they're accusing them of. Yeah, and I think that's really powerful. Yeah, it certainly might make 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 even his questioners think. Well, in what ways maybe am I, you know, am I <laughs> guilty of withholding either or both of these things um, from Caesar or from God? In what ways? Uh, I mean, it says something about citizenship. It says something about being good citizens in the world, but not making that our identity and making mm -hmm. that all about who we are. Um, it, it says a lot, I think, about the, the balance with which we should live, uh, the balance we should strike in our world um, of, of, uh, of carrying through on those responsibilities while at the same time making sure that we give our highest allegiance to, uh, to God. Um, uh, Patrick, can I say something? Sure. Um, the leaders, they were like, to me, faced it because they wanted to get rid of Jesus. And at the same token, the Roman government, they didn't have any love for the, the government either. Right. That's a good point. That's a really good point, right? So they're kind of withholding from both. They're withholding what they, they they're maybe with, wanting to withhold what. They should give to Rome, and they're certainly trying to withhold what they should give to God, which we just saw from the parable of the tenants, right? Where literally those tenants were withholding the produce from the vineyard that belonged to the land. Um, so it, it makes us think, it makes us reflect on, uh, and, and maybe look at our place in the world a little different. Uh, if, if we're following Jesus, then we don't bat an eye at, at giving what we need to give uh, civically to our world and, and to the, the people in our world particularly. Uh, but but that's, not, that's not the most important thing, right? What happens to our money isn't, isn't the most important thing for us. Um, our identity as Americans, our identity as Chicagoans, uh, not, the, not the central truth of who we are. Um, and in Jesus, that, that central truth is, is, is more clear. Uh, well, so then we have some Sadducees. Who are the Sadducees? Conservative religious leaders. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in the religious, in the resurrection, so they were sad, you see. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> they were 
paying attention to the Bible. I was. I was paying attention. That's what I learned. That's that's the main thing I learned about the class. Of art. I learned something. Uh, yeah, uh, the the, uh, the Sadducees were a sect of the, of Judaism. They sort of contrasted with the Pharisees. Well, the Pharisees were all about the Torah and the traditions that, that grew up around the law and the prophets, um, and and keeping up uh, keeping those very tightly and very rigidly. The Sadducees were more uh, the temple. Uh, Temple people. They were the folks who were uh, who, who sort of maintained the temple uh, structure and 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 uh, administration. And so uh, they they were they mainly just uh, recognized the Torah, the first five books of the uh, Law of Moses, uh, and they uh, didn't see anything in there about a resurrection. So they didn't believe in in resurrection. Uh, and so they come to Jesus with what they consider a brilliant question. And actually, when you think about it, it is kind of an interesting question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife, but no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Leverant marriage, right? We know about this, maybe, I think, most of us, maybe. And, and under the law, if, 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 if a man died, uh, his brother had the responsibility to marry the wife and, uh, and, and bring children into the world in the name of his brother. He would carry on his brother's family, uh, family divisions and tribes and, and, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, clans were very important in, in uh, dividing property and, and lots, of, lots of reasons. And so, so that was that was that was Bible. That was important. So, all right, that's the law, right? Now there were seven brothers. Uh, the Sadducees say in this hypothetical uh, episode, the first one married a woman and died childless. The second, and then the third married her, and in the same way, the seven died, leaving no children. Finally, the woman died too. She has the worst luck, by the way, in husbands of anybody in history. Think the maybe <laughs> maybe take a look at her maybe right? like maybe fourth, and, fourth <laughs> six and seven brothers right think, should be, yeah. is she the problem for this? there was actually a, uh, one of the apocryphal books now I forgot which one is uh, there's actually a story about the, uh, like this uh, anyway um, the question the Sadducees have then for Jesus is at the resurrection whose wife will she be since the seven were married to you get the question, right? There were seven guys married to her in life. After the resurrection, who will she be married to? Again, they're trying to trap it. They're trying to undermine it, right? It's, like, it's less a trap this time as much as just a, a question that's going to expose, they think, his ignorance and his <clears throat> lack of logic. He defends resurrection. Uh, he, you know, it's going to look kind of foolish with this, with what they think, with this, uh, with this, uh, this hypothetical. Jesus replied, the people of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage, and they can no longer die, for they're like the angels. They're God's children, since they're the children of the resurrection. Uh, we'll pause there because there's more, he says, but uh, so, so what's his answer? You would not be married to any of them. Okay. There's no marriage. There, there is not, because that's not the way life is in the age to come, right? right. The mistake they're making is assuming that life in the age to come is the same as life now. That's kind of the mistake the scribes and Pharisees were making, right? That, that, that life as we know it is the important thing. Life as we are used to and accustomed to is is you know it, it, the, the assumptions that we make now we can carry with us into the next age and jesus is saying the next age is going to be different we're not going to be like that the questions of marriage and sexuality don't enter the picture because it's a different life it's a different world it's a different age um, 
And, and you know, for me at least, it, it kind of makes me think about, well, you know, what, what are the things I assume now uh, that are important, that, that, that are central to me now, that, that won't be so central to me in the age to come? Uh, that's not saying those things now we should ignore, obviously, but, but it does make us think about how we should be reconsidering the, the priorities that we have sometimes based on uh, what, is, what is central in, in, in the life to come. A lot in our culture revolves around marriage and sexuality, a lot of identity revolves around that. And, and I, I think that maybe this should give us a little pause. Um, in the account of the burning bush, he goes on to say, even Moses showed that the dead rise, for he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. For to him, all are alive. Sadducees didn't find in the law of Moses any support for resurrection. Jesus gives them something, right? <laughs> he, God, God, God is called the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in, the, in, in Moses, in the law of Moses. Uh, he's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the Lord. To him, all are alive. The children of the resurrection, right? Abraham and Jacob are still alive with God. That's right. That's right. That's right. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to God, still live. And would live, you know, there, there would be resurrection. There would be this uh, this day when death is done away with. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Was that what Moses meant when he called God the God of uh, Isaac? No. It's, I mean, but it's, it's a it's kind of a rabbinical argument. It's, it's a lovely rabbinical argument. It it's, it's uses the language uh, and, and, and sort of uh, teases out a shade of meaning that, that no, probably Moses didn't necessarily intend in the moment, uh, but uh, but for for uh, for the purposes of this argument, it's a it's a nice use of the the text as as the Sadducees would have appreciated. Some of the teachers of the law, in fact, not the Sadducees, some of the teachers of the law who have just tried to trap him say, hey, that, that's pretty good. <laughs> And no one dared to ask any more questions. So if nobody's going to ask him questions, he's going to ask a question, right? And so in verse 41, we have these words. Then Jesus said to him, why is it said that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself declares in the book of Psalms, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. David calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? And we may need to look at this psalm. Um, if, you, uh, if you care to, it's Psalm 110. One. And, uh, sorry, what? <laughs> and um, It begins, here is the Lord's proclamation to my Lord. Sit down at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your, uh, your footstool. The Lord extends your dominion from Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people willingly follow you when you go into battle. Um, the Lord makes this promise on oath. You will not revoke it. You're an eternal priest after the pattern of Melchizedek. The Lord at your right hand, he strikes down kings the day he unleashes his anger. He executes judgment against the nations. From the stream along the road he drinks, he lifts up his head. So, so what you have in Psalm 110 is uh, a royal psalm, uh, sort of a, a coronation psalm. And it's, it's an announcement of God's proclamation, God's message to uh a king, and probably it's it's to Solomon or to one of David's descendants, as 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 David proclaims the the coming power of, of this king, uh, and so the Lord says to 
this coming king who David refers to as my Lord. You get that. You, you see that? Does that make sense? Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so so that, that's, that's, that's the song. And Jesus says, well, there's something interesting there, isn't there? Uh, David calls the Messiah Lord. How could he be David's son if he calls him Lord? And Jesus just leaves that question hanging. What's he asking? What, what's, what, what's he wanting them to, to understand? What, what's he wanting them to, to do with this question that he asks? That the Messiah is greater than David. That the Messiah is greater than David. That's, that's sort of the point, right? David calls him Lord. You, you call, you refer to those greater than you in terms like that. And so David refers to his, his descendant as Lord. Now, by Jesus' day, this psalm was quoted in other contexts as a messianic psalm, the psalm that, that, that predicted the Messiah. So that's why Jesus, Jesus uses it this way and why he takes that reference to, to, to be about the, the Messiah, whoever he may be, right? And so he's asking Maybe you need to rethink what you're thinking about the, about the Messiah. Maybe you need to rethink what you're, what you're thinking and expecting God is going to do. Uh, Messiah was supposed to be maybe a general, maybe a teacher, maybe a prophet, maybe a priest. There were all sorts of assumptions about who this Messiah might be. And Jesus is, again, wanting them to rethink the assumptions that they're making. And, and Imagine that the Messiah might be even more than they think he is. He might actually be someone that David would refer to as the greatest king in the history of Israel, right? The one that they all sort of pointed back to, the progenitor of the house of David. Um, he might be, the Messiah might be someone that even David would have to exalt and, and lift up. And for us, we go, well, sure. <laughs> but for them, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a leap. For them, that's, that's a striking idea. And Jesus is planting in their minds the idea. Nobody thought that Messiah was going to be divine in some way. Nobody was expecting that. Nobody was expecting that the Messiah would literally be the Son of God, right? And so they're, they're struggling with they're, 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 and Jesus wants them to, to, to question their assumptions. Question assumptions. Jesus says, does a lot of that, right? The idea is that the, the, the things that we assume, the prejudices we have, the, 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 just the, the things we don't even bother to question. Jesus sometimes asks us to question those things. Other comments or thoughts up to that point? I believe he's emphasizing to sit at my right hand, to be literal, to be literal, that the Messiah will be sitting at the right hand, you know, the right hand of God. Okay, and only, only God, only the divine can sit, be at the right, at, be in the presence of God. No, no man can be in the presence, you know, no man can be necessarily in the presence of God, you know, directly in the presence of God. And throughout the New Testament, something gets made of that at various times, right? Jesus sitting at the Lord's right hand, Jesus uh, there to intercede for us, to, 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 yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. Verse 45, while all the people were listening, Jesus said to his disciples, beware of the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes, love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces, have the most important seats in the synagogues, in places of honored banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. 
times. These men will be punished most severely. So he's kind of turning in, in response to the, the, the spies and the, the insincerity and the flattering and the attempts to, to trap him. He turns to those teachers of the law and he says, they're not what they pretend to be, right? That's, that's what he's getting at, right? They're not what they pretend to be. They, they like to take on the trappings of being leaders. They like to be recognized. They like to be noticed. They like to be uh, influential and honored and, and uh, in these powerful positions. Um, but they'll also devour widows' houses if they get a chance. What, what does he mean by that? Well, for one thing, they reap a lot of benefits. Okay. Being, you know, um, in those positions and they take advantage okay. of the uh, widows and people that, you know, can, I guess, um, question or, you know, their motives and stuff like that. They just don't know about their motives because they're always, I guess, um, in their face, they're like, they love them when indeed they don't. Yeah, widows in Jesus' day uh, didn't have a lot of options, didn't have advocates. They couldn't really take advantage of, of uh, a lot of the, the uh, ways that justice kind of was done. And, 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 um, and so, um, you know, without that influence, they were often, uh, they, they tended, to be, tended to be taken advantage of. Uh, you could see how uh, a widow could, be taken advantage of in a uh, lawsuit of some sort, in a court case of some sort, and somebody just take away her house from her without anybody to advocate for, without anybody to, to stand up for her rights. That's why throughout the Old Testament, right, the, the widows and the orphans are, uh, are central to God's concern. Make sure you care for the widows and the orphans because they don't have anybody looking out for them. God, in fact, has said that he's the God of the widows and orphans, right? He's the one that, that, that looks out for it. Um, but on the other hand, uh, Patrick, yeah. I think these men were respected, highly respected, and so they trusted them. And it still, it still happens, right? It still happens that that people in powerful positions sometimes take advantage of those positions and take advantage of people who can't really fight back against them, can't do anything about it. And that happens in churches, it happens in government, it happens in, you know, in companies, it happens in, in all kinds of time, places where people have positions of influence uh, and, and they misuse them and they wind up they, they they hurt people and they they take away what people need to survive. Imagine taking a widow's house. Right? Uh, we we have the, we've had the parable uh, with because in eighteen uh, the parable of the persistent widow, right? Who uh, comes to that that official over and over again? Give me justice against my enemy. It's something like that that Jesus is picturing. Only there's nobody that's actually going to stand up for her in this case, and so. Uh, so Jesus, I mean, and, and to make it worse, they cloak all of that with their power, their position of religious leader. He says they'll be punished most severely for that. Um, we, we talk about the fact that all sin is the same. And, and in, in some ways that's true. All sin, whatever it is, alienates us from God, right? But don't you, doesn't it seem like in scripture <laughs> there are sins that, <coughs> that God countenances even less? <laughs> I mean, and he said they'll be punished most severely for, for these, these kinds of actions. Uh, there, are, there are sins that, you know, that, that are worse than other sins in some ways in the in the people that they hurt and in the 
the, the consequences uh, in, that ripple out into the lives of, of people around him. Uh, and, and he's, you know, he's very specific. These, these men, whoever they are, will be punished for what they've done. Other thoughts? They were neglecting God's. Yeah. God's law. Well, we just talked about That's giving to God what is God's, right? And 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 yeah. this is maybe one of those cases where uh, where they they were not giving to God the justice and the righteousness and the, the compassion that God demanded from them. Again, the parable of the tenants, which goes back to Isaiah, the song of the vineyard, in which uh, the vineyard is the nation of Israel, and God says, I came looking for justice, and I got corruption, and I came looking for righteousness, and I got evil. Um, did not receive what he should receive. I don't we think we be especially careful for the people in our uh, in our world who are the most vulnerable and, and at, at the most risk of being <clears throat> being taken advantage of. We we, we especially uh, as God's people ought to be aware of that and, and look out for for people as we have the opportunity. Uh, I think, well, okay. I think by long prayers, he means, well, you know, back in the Sermon of the Mount, he was talking about how the Pharisees were, were going on and, you know, more like maybe they were putting on a show using, you know, long prayers in the wrong way, not necessarily having long prayers, but using long prayers in the wrong way. Or perhaps, you know, they were just mechanical, like chanting type prayers. Yeah, as a show, right? Uh, that's kind of what the NIV, the way the NIV translates it. But for a show, they make long prayers. I don't know what the big behind that is. Um, yeah, for a show is really good translation. Uh, they they they're putting on airs, right? They're 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 praying so that people will admire them and, and uh, for appearance' sake. Mm -hmm. What's that? The NES has for appearance' sake. You know, yeah, on appearance show. Same thing. Right. Yeah. Are are they? You know. Wow. They they must be really spiritual people to pray that long with all those beautiful words, right? Um, you know, it, it contrasts with what Jesus said about praying, you know, going to your closet, closing the door. And I don't think Jesus is against praying for a long time. Jesus prayed all night sometimes, right? right? It's right. not that he's against praying for a long time. It's the, 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 the putting and, on. And sincerity. Yeah, and sincerity, putting on a show, using of religion to impress and manipulate control um, human beings can turn anything into manipulation right i mean we're, we're good at that and 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 that, that's that's here's an example of of using religion to to manipulate well we just talked about widows houses right and uh, as if on cue, in chapter 21, verse 1, as Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasure. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly, I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live um, I cannot read it. 
And the uh, coins in question were worth a tiny fraction of the denarius Jesus asked for uh, early. I think it's one 128th or something. It's almost, it's like a, some translations say penny, and that's that's actually sort of a good <laughs> good way to compare it. Though it's probably even worth less than a penny uh, would be to us. Uh, it's a tiny little amount of money, just a, such a small fraction. It almost seems you know, hard to even imagine having <laughs> denominations that small. But but that's uh, that, that that's they're they're, they're very small uh, amounts of money. And of course, you get the point, right? I always, I, I, this this parable to me is a little bit bittersweet. Following Jesus talking about the the, the teachers of the law devouring widows' houses, right? It, it, it's a little bit. It's like kind of like you know, oh, kind of. I kind of cringe reading it because you know, it's kind of like that poor lady probably couldn't have afforded that much even. You know, she probably didn't even uh, couldn't even shouldn't have even. I mean, when he says she gave all she had to, to live on. Uh, it makes me cry every time I read that. I know, I know. It's it's a, it's a, it really is a, a a bittersweet little parable. You you sort of read it, you think you know it's oh what a great thing that, that she did, and she does do a great thing, and Jesus commends her for it. But it reading it on the backdrop of uh, how uh, widows having houses uh, taken away, I don't know, it loses something for me <laughs> in that. It, it just oh, um, just just hurts. Um, but uh, but you know I, I think it is so it is so beautiful it's yeah it's it's like when we're over in a different country and you see poverty and you see kids happy and giving and it's like they don't realize but the poverty doesn't affect them like me watching your poverty affects me <laughs> and, you know it's like Jesus right. he's, he's pointing this out but she's coming from a place of pure joy and love and she would give any and all she had to Jesus because she loved him. And so it does break our hearts to see this because we're looking at her poverty, but I would suggest we also look at her heart, good night. And it's like the kids that I see playing in different countries. So I go, how are they so happy playing with a can on a yeah. dirt street with no shoes, a torn shirt, but they're the happiest kids and they're not complaining about PlayStation 2 or <laughs> the things we have. So it's both, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And he does, he does commend it. And I think it is a, something that's worth, worth commending. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. It's, it's, it, it's, it's something that we, it's something we should aspire to, right? This, this level, this willingness, this generosity, this, this mm -hmm. gratitude, and it's got to come from gratitude. Uh, she, she gives because she's grateful to, to God. And even in her poverty, she's grateful. Um, and, and compares you know, her gift with all these people who give these gifts out of their, their wealth. Um, and she gives out of her poverty. I read that um, it's not just, you know, she empties out her purse, but her life and I think we touched briefly upon that in discussion here, that her life was in tune with God. Okay. She just doesn't empty out her purse, but that, you know, compare, you know, I mean, you made that comparison too with, with her and the um, religious leaders, but that, you know, her life is she's walking with the Lord and she's devoted to the Lord. And, you know, that goes along with the emptying of the purse too. Not just while well, she just emptied her purse and wow, that's, that was really sacrificial, but she was in tune and walking with the Lord as well. <clears throat> well, I know I feel so, so bad and, and I've been praying for the, um, the people that's coming over here from out of town or like some more came today off the bus, the school buses. And I feel so, so bad because 
they don't have nowhere to go and they go to the police stations and they go to the schools and they go to the to anywhere they go and i feel so bad they had these little backpacks they they don't have no food they don't have no nowhere to go and and i'm just i pray every day that they find somewhere to go and i'll be playing the lotto lotto i pay i tr i try to play the lotto i really do and if i ever hit the lotto i will i will I always say i will have a big old place made for these people and the people the homeless people here that that's already didn't have a place to stay i will have a place made for them people for real because I just pray that everybody find a place to live because it's so sad. And 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 I know I don't see them going to Detroit or nowhere. I just see them coming here. I don't see them going to no other town. I see them coming to Chicago. And I pray that they get the help they need. I really do. It yeah. made me cry. I, I, it, it, I, do. It, it makes me cry. And these are those are exactly some of the people that we're talking about who are on the yeah. march. And they're they're they don't they don't have the the you know room for error we have, you know, the, the cushion that, that, that most of us have. They they they're they're yeah. on the line and they're 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 you know in, in delicate situations, vulnerable situations. And yeah. exactly the people that sometimes get taken advantage of and used as um, <laughs> don't get me started, but used as political uh, pawns and used mm -hmm. in, in ways that uh, human beings should never be uh, used and, and uh, mm -hmm. being sent to New York. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. and they have, the, they have a lot of kids and I'm like, you know, just imagine, dang, what they go through. How did imagine they- Imagine that you are in such a difficult position where you live, where, where you're from, in your home mm -hmm. country, that you would yeah. make that uncertain and dangerous journey that they all make, many with mm -hmm. children, families. Yeah. Just, I, you know, that, that tells you all you need to know about the situation they're in. And yeah. We should be, uh, we should be mindful mm -hmm. and prayerful and as generous yeah. as we can be. Yeah. yeah that makes me cry we got five minutes to do the uh, destruction of the temple so that shouldn't be a problem at all Listen, no, I'm just we're not going to try tonight Michael put together a nice uh, 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 harmony for us of uh, Matthew, Mark and Luke and, and the uh, uh, discourse here about the uh, the temple. So thank you for doing that, Michael. Uh, we will get into that next week uh, and, and uh, uh, spend some time on Jesus. Uh, what's sort of the, the culmination of all these all these these criticisms that he has uh, of, of the, the religious leaders and the religious system, the religious uh, system. <laughs> um, are going to culminate in, in this uh, prediction that, that starts by Kathleen kind of with the disciples kind of being impressed by the wrong things, I think, from Jesus' perspective. And, and uh, they're all impressed with the beautiful stones and the structure and the gifts, the, the offerings that have been made in the temple. And, uh, and Jesus says, time's coming when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Um, and, uh, and they want to know when and how and what, what are you talking about? How will we know? And um, Jesus res responds to, uh, to their questions. And that's what we'll, we'll talk about uh, next week. Bring a pillow. This could be a night of terror. Yes, right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. It ain't good. <laughs>